Hello and welcome to How Money Works Masterclass Part 2. Part 1 is available. If you have not seen that, please review that first before moving into this particular Masterclass Part 2. This is where you'll continue to learn to stop being a sucker when it comes to your money. I'm Mike Amos and I'll be your financial educator for the next 30-45 minutes or so. Financial literacy continues here. Today, we'll take you through the seven money milestones. It's your step-by-step -step action plan designed to help you chart the course from where you are today to financial security, independence, and control. The good news is that no one is too far ahead or too far behind to benefit from these milestones. Throughout this class, we'll continue to hear from the cast of How Money Works, Stop Being a Sucker book. There's a good chance you'll relate to one of them and where they're coming from as you complete this masterclass. Please feel free to make notes in the book. If you do not have the book, feel free to request one. Each milestone is a critical step to help you reach your financial summit. Because of this time we're spending together, you're increasing your financial literacy concept by concept, strategy by strategy, learning to take control of your personal finances, which helps you give the confidence to discuss your situation with a financial professional, which we strongly recommend. The very first milestone as we start today's class is one that you're already on your way to completing. You've begun milestone number one, which is the financial education, which is the first part of this course, Masterclass Part 1. You're becoming more financially ready with each page. Also, a financial professional is the best person to turn to for questions about specific details. We can discuss this with you if you don't have one or if you need help choosing one. Here's another way to say it. In the war for your money, there are two essential tools you'll need to win. We know that the best training point for everyone is to start to combine a financial education with a financial professional. Take this education seriously. You don't get this from school. You don't get this from your parents or your friends. Treat your finances with the level of dedication that you put into your health. Google things, ask questions, but then turn to someone that you trust that actually does this for a living. This is the time when you can put everything you've learned into action with your financial professional who can assist you to crunch the numbers, chart your path, choose products, stay accountable, and course correct along the way. Don't try this alone. Remember what Art of the War author Sun Tzu said, without local guides, your enemy employs the land as a weapon against you. We all need a guide. And make no mistake, we're battling forces who want to take control of our money so we'll continue to remain a sucker for our entire life. By finishing this course and establishing a financial professional as your guide, you'll complete milestone number one, the financial education. Proper protection is milestone number two for a very important reason. You need to protect yourself and your family from possible future loss of income or future loss of savings before you begin the rest of this journey. If you were to die prematurely, your family could be left without your income in addition to being without you. Your current savings probably will not be enough to take care of them. Though protecting yourself is more important than protecting your property, as Thomas Paine put it, you might not be able to fully protect yourself from illness or accidents, but you can protect your income and your wealth. Ironically, protection of your financial assets is called life insurance. It's a defensive strategy motivated by a sense of love, responsibility, or both. How much life insurance should you have? The answer to that is different for everyone based on your situation. However, as a rule of thumb, we recommend you consider having life insurance coverage that's at least 10 times your annual family income. As an example, if you are a $50,000 a year earner, you should consider half a million or $500,000 in coverage. At a conservative 5% rate of return, that would replace half of your income. For a more specific calculation on your family's need, ask your financial professional. Together, you can consider factors like how old you are, how much debt you have, your health, your number of dependents, your role in your business, and your overall financial situation. 
Many people like Dana here didn't know 10 times income was just the starting point for protecting your income. Sounds expensive, but you actually need to look closer into it before you decide you can't do it. You'll be pleasantly surprised. The same people who underestimate how much life insurance they need tend to have a uh, tend to have a tendency to overestimate how much it will actually cost. Both assumptions can keep families from putting proper protection into place. As insure.com says, only about 59% of Americans have life insurance and about half of those are underinsured. You and your financial professional should cover your short-term as well as your long-term debts and other outstanding loans, your financial goals, your mortgage or rent payments, how old your children are, and how much their education could potentially cost. Just like with so many things, life insurance, with all the options out there, seems complex at first, but once you know a little, it becomes far simpler. To start, it's important to understand that all life insurance usually falls into two basic categories, temporary and permanent. Let's look at term life insurance, which provides coverage for a specific period of time, like 10, 20, or even 30 years. It's the most affordable life insurance available because it provides only a core feature, a death benefit, that money paid to the beneficiary when the insured dies, and because it also expires at the end of that term. With term life insurance, it's possible to have financial, financial protection for your family or your business with a relatively small monthly payment. This can make it a fit for anyone with a limited budget during times of highest financial responsibility, like raising your children, paying off things like your mortgage or your college, and running your company if you are a business owner. But what happens when the term on your life insurance ends? There are two scenarios that you can look at. Scenario one is that you just don't need the coverage anymore. You can simply let your policy in, no fuss, no muss. But what if after your term, you still need coverage because you're still paying off your home, or you're a single income couple, or maybe you're supporting grown children or grandchildren, or you're still running your company? For these reasons and others, you might consider scenario number two, keeping term insurance. If you're in good health or if your term policy has guaranteed insurability, you might be able to renew your old policy. Remember, if you want a completely new term policy, you have to qualify medically again. If you can't qualify, a new term policy might not be an option at that point. If you do qualify, the new policy will cost much more because of your age. The older you are, the more expensive new term life insurance is going to be. This is what we call the financial X wave. In your younger years, represented in the blue on the left, you typically have more responsibility and less accumulated wealth. In your later years, the yellow side, the plan is for your accumulated wealth to increase as your responsibilities hopefully decrease. Term insurance is typically most useful when your responsibilities are higher and the wealth is lower, the left side. If these two factors flip later in life as planned, Term life insurance becomes less practical. Your financial professional can help you look at the X wave and apply it to your own individual and unique situation. Now, let's look at permanent insurance. Like term, it provides a death benefit to protect your family financially. However, permanent insurance is designed to be kept in place and protect you for your entire life, not just a period like term. Think of permanent life insurance as a lifelong strategy that can protect your family today secure your wealth in the future, and provide for your family once you're gone. There are three important benefits of permanent life insurance. Number one is the life insurance protection for your entire life. Two, with many permanent life insurance policies, you can add long-term care as an optional rider. And then number three is your accumulated cash value, which can give you flexibility with your premiums. This means if you ever can't pay your premiums for some reason, they can be paid out of your cash value to keep you current. Other benefits that can be included with permanent life insurance, the strategy, can be advantages like absolutely no market risk, long-term care coverage, tax-free growth, tax-free income, and a tax-free legacy. Avoiding taxes is extremely important to consider because it can directly and significantly impact how much money you live on in retirement 
and the amount that you'll actually leave to your heirs. Let's talk about the cash value component of permanent life insurance and why it can be so important. A portion of your monthly premium is set aside in an account that grows over your life of the policy. The money in that account is your cash accumulation and can be used to fund future purchases. You see a, a few possibilities on the screen over here. In addition to no market risk and tax-free income, growth, and legacy, as we just mentioned, life insurance cash value can also be creditor-proof, meaning creditors can't come after it. When you look at this all together, the advantages of cash value benefits are very, very powerful. We saw that long-term care can be added to permanent life insurance policy as a rider. So let's talk about the importance of long-term care insurance just for a moment. You may not know this, but 70% of people age 65 and older will need some type of long-term care services and support at some time in their life. In other words, statistically speaking, you will likely need it. But here's the thing, only 8% of people over the age of 55 have purchased long-term care insurance coverage. That sounds like a possible problem and a very expensive one waiting to happen. Long-term care, or what's referred to as LTC insurance coverage, helps cover out-of-pocket expenses that can really add up in a hurry. It can be used to pay for qualified services like nursing home care, home health care, assisted living care, or adult daycare and you never know it if or when you might need it. And if you do, the average long-term care need, if more than one year, lasts 3.9 years. As you can see here, the average total cost can be a crippling expense if not covered by a policy. The cost without long-term care coverage could drain one or more of your savings assets you were continuing to count on for your future retirement. There are a couple of long-term care options that you should look at. The first is a traditional standalone policy. Even if you don't have life insurance, you can go directly to an insurance company to purchase a standalone long-term care policy. Or you can opt to add it as a rider to your permanent life insurance policy. If it's available for your permanent life insurance policy, you can add the long-term care protection to the policy in the form of a rider for an extra cost. Everyone should look into this option. If you go with option one and buy a traditional standalone policy, there are a few things that you should know, like the fact that premiums start low, but insurance companies can raise those rates on those uh, policies over the life of the policy. Also, you can usually pay for care up front out of your own pocket and then get reimbursed, which can seem as an inconvenience during a very difficult time for you and your family. Another thing to keep in mind with a standalone option is that you can spend thousands on premiums and get absolutely nothing back in return. Although, like we talked about earlier, there's a 70% chance you'll need long-term care, that leaves us with a 30% chance you actually won't. Or you can go with option two and choose to add long-term care rider to a permanent life insurance policy. A key advantage of this option is that the life insurance companies typically don't raise rates for life insurance policyholders. Some insurance companies, after a waiting period, pay your money to cover long-term care expenses, which you can spend however you see fit. No need to submit receipts. Once the el eligibility requirements have been met, uh, you are good to spend that money any way you want. Coupling your life and long-term care protection can equal a big savings. If you're one of the lucky ones the 30% who ends up not needing long-term care, your premiums aren't wasted. Instead, your family receives a larger tax-free death benefit. Long-term care riders aren't the only riders available. You can also consider other living benefits like critical, chronic, and terminal riders that can help save the day if you face any health challenges like you see on the screen. You should discuss adding these riders to your permanent life insurance policy with your financial professional. Some are inexpensive or even cost nothing, zero extra to add. Once you have milestone number two covered, it's time to tackle milestone number three, creating your emergency fund. We recommend that you save at least three to six months of your annual income to prepare for any unexpected expenses like unforeseen medical bills, home appliance repairs, or replacements and hassles like you know, major car fixes. 
And don't forget, costly of all, possible unemployment. If you're currently living paycheck to paycheck, like many people are today, your emergency fund could be the insulation that separates you from financial disaster if something actually happens. Check out these sample annual incomes and how much you'll need to fit our three to six month income guideline for the emergency fund. TJ has a good question, which you might be thinking about too. Where do you get the money to create an emergency fund? The best tactic, especially if your income is tight like it is for most, is to put away a little money every month until you reach your suggested goal of about three to six months of income saved. Think of it like a debt payment to yourself. Do until you achieve your emergency fund goal. There are two rules of an emergency fund. Rule number one, your emergency fund is only for unexpected emergencies. That's all, that's it. It's not for gifts, getaways, or sales. It doesn't matter if it sits in your checking savings or a separate account, as long as you're not tempted to use it for anything but a real emergency. Rule number two, if you need to use your emergency fund to fix a car, replace a fridge, or pay for braces, don't hesitate to use the money. That's what it's there for. Just make sure that afterwards you add back a little money every month until your emergency fund is once again fully funded. Once you've worked with your financial professional to square away your protection need, your proper protection need, and your emergency fund, it's time to talk about managing your debt. That's milestone number four. Before you can enjoy any financial security and independence and control, you need to look at the spending habits and strive to reduce and eventually eliminate all of your debt. We hate to say this, but in our culture, debt is a sweeping crisis perpetuated by a society of suckers led astray by the instant gratification desires of their generation. Now, that's a mouthful, but it's also very true. There's no shame in admitting that you struggle with debt as it's one of the most common threats to having a sound financial future. But if it's something that we face and it's best faced head on with the financial support of a financial professional who's on your side. The average American today has $28,900 in personal debt. That does not include mortgages, and many have much, much more. And don't forget, over half of Americans suffer from some kind of anxiety related to their debt. When debt is removed, we can really enjoy life more fully and more freely. Things have been hard with all that's going on right now in the world. So here are the five tips to eliminate and stay out of debt. Know what you owe, no more late payments, go after one debt at a time, start, stop charging and cancel unused subscriptions, and consider refinancing your mortgage. Let's dig into each tip starting with knowing what you owe. We suggest that you make a list of all your credit cards, your debts, and your loans. It may sound tedious, but you'll feel so much better when you actually know what you owe, and you have your arms around these numbers and this information. For each debt, write down your number as well as your dates. Then, once a year, pull your credit report from one of the free online services. Make sure it's accurate and make sure it's up to date. By law, every American has the right to a free credit report once every 12 months. Just go to annualcreditreport.com to get yours. Check the websites of the top credit reporting agencies for pointers on how to improve your credit score and report credit errors. Look for the word dispute. Paying after the due date hurts your credit score and can really accrue some late fees. A good credit score can open opportunities for you, get you lower interest rates on loans and other debt like mortgages. There are two tips for paying on time. You should set up automatic payments or you should consider setting up alarms on your cell phone, whatever it takes to make sure that you are not late. If you have balances on multiple credit cards, pay down the total balance one card at a time. You should pay off the smallest balance or the highest interest rate first. Whichever you choose, you should pay more than the minimum payment and as much as you possibly can, staying within your budget. Here, you could start with card number one, which has the lowest balance by far, even though it has the highest interest rate, 
than card three. Then you could zero out card two, which has a similar balance to card three, but a significantly higher interest rate. This is why writing down your information about each of your debts was such an important first step. Making these decisions will help you build momentum as you steadily el eliminate each one, one at a time. As you pay off each debt, you're feeling better and you're freeing up income, but don't spend it on eating out or new shoes. Use it to create debt elimination momentum by adding money that you were paying to the previous cards to your payment on the next one. This will increase the speed at which you're paying off your debt and hopefully your excitement to get to a debt-free life. Repeat this process until your credit cards are debt-free. Your goal is to have zero balances, but remember, don't close the credit card accounts. It's generally better to keep paid off accounts open from a credit score standpoint. Many people stop charging things and stay off the credit card debt by stashing their credit cards in a safe place. Another way to stay out of the credit card debt hole is to check your cards and mobile pay that pulls up the balance on your checking account. Also consider canceling digital subscriptions like online video streaming services that you don't use much and then put that money towards your debt payments. One way to lower your mortgage payment is to consider refinancing, which could help you free up cash to accelerate your debt payoff. By paying off one debt at a time and by correcting your credit report errors and reducing your debt, your credit score should improve over time. And in that time, you may qualify for a more favorable interest rate or a type of loan in your home that benefits you at that time. Increasing your cash flow is milestone number five. While the suckers gripe about how tight things are, the wealthy are plotting how to free up more cash flow. This means seeking out ways to earn additional income and better managing their expenses. Let's investigate how to actually do this. Cash flow is the money that you have available to spend or to save. After you've established proper protection, your emergency fund, and focused on your debt management, you're ready to zero in on growing your income. More income can accelerate everything and your financial professional are working towards and create a momentum and a velocity towards reaching those endpoints. You may feel like George, plum stuck with your budget and finances, but after learning about the many options and ideas out there, almost everyone can find a way to get unstuck and create more cash flow. Let's look at some ways to get unstuck by finding your fire in the hole, chili opportunities. Here are a few things you can do to increase your cash flow. Create and stick to a budget, develop a written game plan, reduce spending on expenses like car and home insurance. Here are a few more. Reposition your savings, drop private mortgage insurance, PMI, on your mortgage if you qualify. Your financial professional can help you guide through these things, more ideas, and an overall game plan. There are three big moves to supercharge your cash flow. Add a side gig. Earning additional income is almost always a quicker way to reach your financial goals than just trying to spend less. A recent survey found that 45% of U.S. workers have a side gig earning on average $1,122 per month. Maybe it's time for you to get into the action. Low-cost business opportunities are also out there. As Steve Seabolt says, Find a problem people have and solve it. By becoming an entrepreneur part-time, you can leverage time outside of your day job. As your income increases, a moment could soon come where you can transition from being a part-time business owner and a full-time employee to vice versa. You can actually make that bridge and take more control over your cash flow. Adjust your W-2 allowances. Some people celebrate receiving a big tax refund each year. If that's you, consider this. By adjusting your W-2 allowances, more of your cash could be in your paycheck all year long instead of with the IRS, but consult your tax professional before making any changes at all. Milestone number six is a big and exciting one. It focuses on building wealth. This is the milestone where your results appear on your bottom line. This is where you avoid the impact of taxes, losses, and inflation, and you do your best to accumulate and grow your net worth. 
With the possibility of longevity, adding so many years to your life, that brings up one question. Will your wealth last as long as you do? You have to be able to answer that question. According to a recent study, 63% of people have a greater fear of running out of money in retirement than actually dying. And it's a real threat in light of this eye-opening statistic. For retirement age couples, there's a 50% chance one spouse will live past the age of 95. Here's the crux of milestone number six. Whatever stage of life you're in, you have to start building wealth now. Put another way, yesterday is better than tomorrow. As you embark on wealth building, there are four disciplines to help you stay on track and not lose ground. Look at them with me. Save regularly and don't touch it. Review your goals and make adjustments as necessary and needed. In addition to that, there are four threats every wealth, every wealth builder must conquer. Think of these as your wealth building enemies. Each of these will come at you from a different direction. You have to beat them. And in order to beat them, we'll have to address them individually. Let's start with one of the worst, procrastination. As one, as one quote says, procrastination can be hands down our favorite form of self-sabotage. Then we'll pick apart market losses, inflation, and of course, the dreaded taxes. Procrastination is the enemy of saving and investing. It's best described as inaction. The best tactic to overcome procrastination is prioritization. You simply move the five actions to overcome financial procrastination to the top of your to-do list. Flag them as urgent and get them started immediately. You can never get lost time back. Never. It's an asset we all have and so many of us waste. Stop doing that today. Inflation is also known as the tax of time. The annual inflation rate has averaged right around 2.8% for the last 100 years. Can you approximate the number of years it takes the cost of goods to double at a steady 2.8% annual inflation rate? Hint, remember the rule of 72 from Masterclass Part 1 well, it's time to put your knowledge of the rule of 72 to work. The answer is almost 26 years. One of the essential reasons to build wealth using the power of compound interest is to stay ahead of inflation. When you know that the enemy is slowly devalu devaluing your savings by raising the cost of goods, it should drive you to become more committed to growing and building your strategy of wealth accumulation. Don't let it scare you. Let it drive you to take action. The next enemy to wealth building is the impact of losses. Often underestimated, it's the threat that can wreck your savings goals and force you to adjust your lifestyle in retirement. Here's a simple picture that illustrates how people miscalculate the impact of losses. If you were to lose 50% of your investment, which happened twice in the stock market in the last 20 years, what percentage of gain would you need to get back to 100%? The answer is 50%, right? Wrong. It takes 100% gain after a 50% loss to get back to even. That's not easy to do and that's why it's so important to protect what you already have. Maybe this is the reason Warren Buffett famously said about investing, rule number one is to never lose money and rule number two, never forget rule number one. So what can you do to prevent losses? First, look at every option to reduce the risk. Second, consider how best to diversify your portfolio. And third, utilize the right financial vehicles for your situation. Remember, don't procrastinate. Consider inflation and talk with your financial professional about ways to reduce or remove the impact of losses from your strategy. And last, the impact of taxes, the 800 pound gorilla of wealth building threats. Nobody likes paying taxes, especially when you're preparing for retirement. The tax strategy that you put in place today can determine how much money you keep, how much you pay the government, and ultimately how much you leave for your kids. Understanding how financial vehicles are taxed differently can help you make strategic decisions that can help pay off big time down the road. If you save $10,000 at age 29 and earned a 9% annual return each year, you would have 250,000 or a quarter million dollars when you reached age 65. 
Think like a farmer for a second. Would you rather pay taxes on the seed or the harvest? Of course, whichever is smaller, which is usually what you start with. A farmer would rather pay taxes on the seed, not the harvest. An investor would rather pay taxes on the money before it grows, not after. You'll either pay taxes now, later, or never. Which one will apply to you? It depends on the vehicle that you choose. Again, this is where a financial professional can greatly assist and help you. When you sit down with them, they can help you figure out you know, how you're being taxed now and what your strategy can be going forward. The colors of the icons matter. Red is tax now, yellow is tax later. The decisions get simpler when you break it down to these categories and colors. Do you have any red or yellow financial vehicles that you see out there? If so, you need to know how you're going to be taxed. Green is the color of money and growth. It's also our color for tax never. Different types of accounts can be taxed completely differently. Green icons mean no tax at all. Green never looks so good, right? And any of these tax vehicles will never be part of your wealth building strategy if you don't understand and use them properly. Again, your financial professional can be great help in choosing the right products and the right strategies and the right vehicles for your unique situation. The boxer Mike Tyson said one time, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the mouth. Did I hear he's considered coming out of retirement? He's in his late 50s now and hasn't boxed in more than 15 years. Maybe he should listen to his own words. The best way to avoid running out of money in retirement is by not putting yourself in a position for it to happen to you. In other words, stay out of the ring. In a recent Gallup survey, 85% of non-retired Americans investors strongly agreed that having a guaranteed income stream in retirement to supplement Social Security benefits is absolutely crucial and critical. Guaranteed income can help you avoid the risk of running out of money in your retirement. There are three components of a reliable retirement income. We, we recommend you consider all of them. Maintain potential for growth by participating in the upside growth potential tied to the market. Reduce or remove potential for losses by eliminating downside risk tied to the market and then create a predictable income that lasts and prevent the possibility of running out of money in retirement with an income stream that you can actually count on going forward. Here's what it looks like when you nail it. Gap closed. Retirement savings goals reached. By stacking up multiple streams of income, this person will have a reliable income because they've saved the amount necessary and got the rate of return necessary to reach the savings required to make the... Uh, retirement they imagined possible. They'll never run out of money in retirement and could even have some left over to leave as a legacy to the children. How does that sound? Well, you can work with your financial professional to figure out your income streams and the numbers you need to be. And the very last milestone, protect your wealth by creating a will and guarding your legacy. This is something that even the rich miss sometimes. Prince, as well as Aretha Franklin, both of whom died just a few years ago, had sizable estates, but neither had an estate plan. Both left their families and their business partners with an emotional, financial, and legal mess taking years to untangle and sort out. This shows how important it is to protect your wealth with an estate plan. According to Rocket Law Survey, 64% of Americans don't have a will. Not surprisingly, the number is higher for younger Americans, 70% of those aged 45 to 54, than for older Americans, 54% of those aged 55 to 64. Do not have a will. Prince was only 57. Your estate plan is how you protect your wealth, your family, and your legacy when you die or if you're incapacitated. It's the set of documents, including your will, used by your loved ones to carry out your wishes, and your decisions. There are four documents in the estate plan that you should include. You'll need a will, your financial power of attorney, an advanced health care directive or a living will, and a HIPAA release. Your legal professional can help you put all of this into place. Having an estate plan can help you avoid the government making decisions about who gets your property and who takes care of your children. 
this process of a court administrating a state in accordance with the state laws is called probate. No one wants to go through that if they do not have to. You can also help your family and your business partners avoid unnecessary expenses and delays with the probate process with one additional estate planning tool, a trust. Trust can do many things for you. Again, your legal professional can give you the best advice when it comes to trust. Please keep in mind that some of your assets pass directly to your named beneficiaries at the time of death and are not transferred through a will or a trust. Things like life insurance, annuities, IRAs, 401ks, and other qualified retirement plans work that way. Some bank and investment accounts also distribute funds directly to your named beneficiaries. Jointly owned assets with rights of survivorship pass directly to the joint tenant at the time of death. If you think estate planning will be too expensive or time consuming, then you haven't considered the cost to your loved ones heading down the road at that particular time in the future. The truth is there are options for almost every single budget out there. We recommend you put this milestone in place right away. We're almost finished here. Think about what concept resonated with you the most today. That's what we started the mission with, eradicating financial literacy. This is how you start to take control of your finances. We call it the money discovery. This works like a driving directions on your mobile phone or a GPS. Two points of reference is all you need, where you are right now and then where it is that you actually want to go. The same is true to chart the course for, for your financial road. The How Money Works discovery in the book can help you take care of that. Of course, we suggest that you share this information with your financial professional to make sure you're on track to reach your goals and dreams. If you don't currently have a financial professional to turn to, the first of the seven money milestones is financial education. Since you've hopefully read the How Money Works book, you've already stated and started down the path of learning how it really works. We can help you walk through the other six milestones. We do this in two steps. The first step is called a discovery call, where we spend about 15 minutes identifying where you are right now in your financial life, and then most importantly, where you want to go. Then our team spends a few days crunching the number, crunching the numbers, searching the financial industry for the best products and the services to meet your individual needs, and then identifying the ones that best fit your current situation as well as your financial goals in the future. Then we have a solutions appointment where we actually get back together, have a screen share, and walk through the steps we recommend that you take to achieve your goals. We're at the conclusion of today's session and the entire How Money Works Masterclass. Part one and part two have been completed now. Milestones like the ones that you just learned about will bring up questions like the ones that you see on the screen here. A financial professional is absolutely the best person to turn to for questions like these and others. We can discuss this with you if you don't have one or if you need help choosing one. Sharing financial literacy and education is what we do. It's our mission. Thank you for your time today and attention and we wish you all the best in your financial future.